So hopefully we can make this a little bit more interesting than patent law, which is important, but can be dry at an occasion. The, uh, maybe we should start off with a rock star, the serial entrepreneur. Ryan, tell us about your last business, the, uh, which was in personalized medicine. The, uh, just give us a quick overview. Sure, John. Um, first of all, I did see at least one or two serial entrepreneurs out there, so thank you for being here. Um, DNA Direct, which I sold to Medco Health Solutions exactly two years ago, and um, as of January 1st, I'm now a free agent. And so it's sort of a, a fun opportunity, actually, to be here not representing within the field of personalized medicine a particular platform or product or, or, um, or an agenda. Um, DNA Direct is a company that provides genetic information, web enables genomic decision making, has a network of genomic counselors, and is a core part now of Medco as a PBM, uh, and uh, obviously um, potentially a part of Express Scripts if the FTC has its way. So, so Ryan, you, you titled this se session Confessions of a Serial Entrepreneur, so I'm curious. <laughs> What do you have to confess? What, was in my mind? what would you do differently? Well, actually, it was really originally reflections, and it's not so much confessions as it is. It, it, it felt to me like a moment to actually step back and think about, in seven years of having my head down, focused on this field, what are the things that I would do different today in this current environment? And I think it's so exciting seeing um, the new advances in the technology, but it also feels like we're back just where I was seven years ago, where we're still facing the same bottleneck, which is the information, how do you put it in context, who helps put it in context, how do we arm the physician, the patient, to make proper decisions. And yet we're so much further along on the ability to sequence, like Life Technology announced the other week, and in you know two hours, a whole genome. So, to me, the you know what is going to be so important is that, um, and I like the way Jamie Haywood talked about it, is that we really do think about this more as a whole system, and that we build companies really thinking all at once about all these different components. So for the entrepreneurs in the room, the, we at Claremont Creek, we invest in early stage companies and we have about a half dozen investments in personalized medicine and we put a huge emphasis on the entrepreneur. How did you come up with the idea for DNA Direct and what other pathways did you explore before sure. picking that one? Well, prior to DNA Direct, I started a company called Direct Medical Knowledge, which built the first online consumer health library and I sold that company to WebMD. And when I sold it, I realized I'd just been hearing more about the whole genome uh, initiative to discover, uh, to uncode. And I realized what an opportunity it was going to be to transform medicine, but that part of the missing puzzle was bringing this transition into clinical practice and giving consumers direct access. So I started DNA Direct in 2005 with the idea of going direct to consumer. And what I knew was that in order to not be completely out of line in the medical community, we had to align ourselves with clinical utility from the get-go. And we really built an advisory and a board and I think a constituents based on that high standard. And so step one, you found the next new thing to do. Step two, you need to get a little bit of something going and you need some capital. Who well, did you go to to get capital? And sure. How did you evolve well, your I capital Well, I've got to say, I went back to the Series A investor of my last company who made money. <laughs> That's ah. always a good first step. Um, but really, that and these initial seed investors, and I think probably everybody in this room is, is an innovator at one level or another, and you all know that it takes a fair amount of mission-centric drive to actually bring these ideas into, into focus. And I think the single most important thing that uh, an innovator has to have is a like-minded group of people to help forge through a new idea. They have to be the ones that, and I had medical advisors, some of them are here in this audience, who went to the first um, ASHG meeting or ACMG, uh, ACMG meeting uh, in front of their colleagues as medical geneticists and said, I'm going to back this consumer medical company and got arrows in their back you know, because they were so outside the box of what was considered appropriate in terms of consumer genetics. And those first people and, and that initial board and those initial investors 
we're all focused on that same mission. How do we move this field forward? And investors usually don't want to stay forever. So you built the company for six years before <coughs> selling to Medco. Why sell when you did, as opposed to building longer and taking it public? How did you keep your board members aligned and your investors aligned as you built the business and inevitably changed it along the way? Right. Well, John, as a, as a VC, you know how hard that is. So I, I like to think that you know, when, you, when you start out, your initial investors are very directly involved in the company. It's so small, and everybody is in at the same level. The further you go in your Series A and Series B investors, the money becomes less direct. In a sense, it's not their money anymore. Very often, you're representing your other investors or your other partners in a, in a deal. And the bigger the investment pool, the further distance it goes. And I think it, be, it starts to create an us-them. It can create an us-them culture. You're all in it together at the beginning as we, and it's collaborative. As you grow, you can run into an us and a them. They, VCs, have to represent their shareholders, and it's not necessarily the shareholders of the actual uh, company at stake. So it's, it's a very tricky balance, and I think the most important advice, if I was to give anyone, is to really think about that dynamic from the get-go and make sure that you have independent advisors involved in an idea who have no vested interest under other than the hidden equity of belonging to that idea. And I think that's, that, that terminology, the hidden equity, is something one of my board members met, mentioned to me, and I thought it was really so profound because um, there are different reasons that we are all motivated. And I think knowing those different reasons and knowing how to tap and, and refine a, a company and its board and its management team as it grows, I think is, is really a skill that you know, you're, you're constantly always adapting. Can you give us a couple of specific examples or techniques that you used along the way to keep your investors aligned? Well, uh, my best technique was having a really good chairman who, who had no vested interest other than that hidden equity. And yes, you know, he had a stock equity as well, but that wasn't his motivation. And I think he was that glue that was very profound, especially in the, in the dark days when you're trying to figure out your business model. I mean, DNA Direct went from consumer genomics to working with payers, which we still do, um, providing pre-authorization for molecular diagnostics. And we do it with some very large payers. That's a very different world and a very different channel. DNA Direct helps uh, provide horsepower to some of these genomic medicine institutes. Very different business than the core business of working with a, with a PBM like Medco. And I think that um, the ability to weather those different storms at, at those inflection points is, um, is an art. Yeah, I'm reminded of Navigenics, which made a, a similar change. They started in Consumer Direct like 23andMe. The, uh, and the piece of their business that's getting traction right now is having a corporate sales force that calls on corporate the uh, benefit plans and sells Navigenics as a service that you can pick up as part of your cafeteria plan for free large corporation benefits. That's where they're making money. It's kind of just really interesting. Well, there's one thing before we close, John, I want to make sure I get in my two cents on, which is the real reason I came up here to today, and, and that is that I feel like going back over these seven years that there has been so much progress in this field, and we need to find as an industry a way to quantify it better for the media. When I was at J.P. Morgan the other week and Life Technologies made it its announcement around sequencing, it was not picked up in the New York Times. It was picked up by Reuters and a number of other public media companies that basically talked about how alarming it is that all of a sudden we're going to have more people know that they're carrying an Alzheimer's gene and not know what to do with it. Well, this was what I was hearing seven years ago. We've made progress. And if this industry can find a way to quantify the progress we've made, demonstrate how benign most genetic testing is and the power of that genetic information, and ideally help show the return on the investment to the payer community that this is not just about extending very expensive drugs to people, this is about targeting drugs and reducing the waste in the system. 
So, Ryan, what's next for you? The uh, time out. Time out. Um, <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> Seriously. <Okay. laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs>